I'm April with With My Hands Homestead, and it is almost Christmas! As I am filming this, it is two days before Christmas Eve, and to celebrate the end of the year and the new year coming up, I am going to do a series all about our recap from last year and our goals for 2020. So, since it is the end of December now, I thought I'd kick it off talking about my favorite tomato seeds, or at least the ones that I felt like did the best last year. So I have a whole list of everything, of all the tomatoes that I grew last year, I'm ranking them from my least favorite to my favorite, and hopefully that can help you guys when you choose or think about what you want to grow for next year. Alright, number nine, which is my least favorite tomato that I grew last year, is Black from Tula. Now, I had been really excited to grow it. This was going to be my first ever black or dark tomato. Um, and in reality, it was really inconsistent. It is the only variety of tomato, and I think I grew about three um, plants of these, it, they varied in size and even color, even on the same plant, so much. And I'll insert a picture, um, if, I know I have one, I'll insert one into the video, but I think I only got one that was the size of my palm, and that was the biggest one, which I thought they were supposed to be on the bigger side. Um, I think they're classified as a slicer tomato, but... I mean, most of them were like little two ounce, um, more like a saladette kind, and they were more pink. Like, I would, looking at them, I would not think that they were a black tomato or a purple tomato or anything. They looked pink. They looked like a pink tomato. Um, I, I was not impressed. Um, they tasted pretty good. I mean, they really did, but th it... They didn't produce very well. They were the most, they got the most disease. Like, I think all three of them got a disease. Um, they just did the worst. I was not impressed. I don't think I'm even going to bother planting them next year at all. My number eight tomato, which is my second not favorite, <laughs> is the pear tomato. They, I will plant them again next year. So I had a hard time ranking a lot of these because they might be good in one area and not as good in other areas. Um, the positives were they were the only yellow tomato that I really like. <laughs> um, I really like the variety. Like when I get a big harvest of tomatoes, especially cherry tomatoes, I just love having a yellow pear in there to switch up the shape and to switch up the color. Um, <clears throat> I like the flavor. I think they're fine. Um, they're nice and sweet. I like them. They are really, really good dried. Um, they're my one of my favorites dried for sure, um, which is how I use the majority of my cherry tomatoes. I just love snacking on dried cherry tomatoes. Um, which are all great things, and they really did not split like I've heard a lot of other people say. Some of my other varieties did split a lot, but these, I mean, maybe a couple of them did, but they all were pretty fine. The reason why I'm ranking them so low is the, the habit that they had, and I don't know what the deal is that they're all like this or just my plants were for some reason, but they, it was almost like they got really leggy, which might not make a lot of sense, but they had, like, they really vined out, like, they took over. I had them trellised up with, um, like, I have a lot of tomatoes in certain beds. I'll, I'm sure I'll do a garden tour at some point, and it'll make a little bit more sense, but they would sprawl out the longest, but not have as many tomatoes. Like, the, the plant would be huge, 
but there weren't as many tomatoes as you would expect for how much space it took up. Um, and that I really didn't like. Like it really, it got all over like all of the tomatoes that were bordering it and just like it had a lot of extra shoots come up, like even from the root, which was really weird. Um, it really took over, but for it taking over, it didn't produce like I would have expected. So that's why it is on my bottom of the list, um, just because I was really disappointed with the way it grew. Number seven is Tommy Toe Cherry Tomatoes. So this is my first year growing them. I wanted to switch it up. Um, usually I grow Sweet Hundreds, to be completely honest. Um, they're a hybrid. You can get anywhere. They're really, really popular. Um, spoiler alert, I'm going to go back to the Sweet Hundreds next year. These were, this is going to sound weird, but they were huge. They were huge, and that was a negative, in my opinion, for cherry tomatoes. They ended up being more like saladette size. So really, all in all, in my garden last year, I felt like I got all saladette tomatoes. <laughs> um, the, the black from Tula was supposed to be bigger and ended up smaller. These were supposed to be smaller and ended up bigger. They're just too big to just pop in your mouth, which is what... The whole point, in my opinion, of cherry tomatoes is, like, garden candy, just pick one off and pop them in your mouth, like, while you're gardening. But they were, like, a two-biter, and I'm not into that. <laughs> um, so, I did not really like them. They are kind of high on my list because they actually did taste pretty good. Um, I like Sweet Hundreds better, but when you think of a cherry tomato, this is what they taste like. Like that's exactly what you would expect from them. Um, they were really productive. They grew pretty well. They grew all season just like you would expect. Um, I really liked them dried. They didn't have a ton of pulp which was really nice. So even though they were big, they weren't really pulpy like a saladette. And they actually had like a little bit of meat on them. So I liked that. I used these in my salsas the most. Um, that's really surprisingly what I ended up using them for. Um, I just chopped them up and would make quick salsa with them because I would get so many. It was really easy and I like to save my big tomatoes for like hamburgers or like bigger things. I also put these in sauce too. I did the same thing that I did with the Black Versailles. Um, I just cut the top off, squeeze them, pop them in, no problem. So they were just kind of middle of the road, N not, you know, not my favorite, not my least favorite. I'm not sure if I'll grow them next year. I hate to waste seeds, so who are we kidding? I probably will, <laughs> but um, when the pack runs out, I won't be buying them again. Okay, number six is the Black Vernissage, I think. These came as a free seed from Baker Creek. So when I put in my order last year, they came as a freebie. I it was actually really happily surprised. Um, I thought I would not like them because they are a salad at tomato. So they only get about that big, like too big to be a cherry tomato, definitely not big enough to do to be a slicer. I don't usually have any use for them at all. <laughs> um, I don't grow them on purpose. I gave it a shot because they were free seeds, but actually for what they are, they're really, really good. They were the first tomato out of everything to flower and like ripen in my in-ground garden, not including my um, potted plants that I had started way earlier. But the ones that I had started for the summer garden, they were the first. Um, they were really consistent. They produced really well. So unlike the pear, to the yellow pears, these were really, like the volume that you got was really comparable to their size. So like, what you see is what you get, and it was really, really impressive. Um, they tasted pretty good. Um, what I didn't like about them was they have a lot of pulp. 
Um, they have really thin walls and a lot of pulp, so they're not one that you would slice. Um, you know, like putting them on burger, I've tried to put them on burgers or put them in salsa. They do not work well with salsa. Definitely would not recommend. Um, but what I did do, um, if you chop the top straight off and just squirt them, just squeeze them, the pulp comes out really easily, which is a perk. So whenever I would use them, I would chop the top off, squeeze them so that they were empty. And I would either dry them or I would pop them into a sauce. So when I was making a big batch of sauce, I usually had a ton of these on hand. And I would put them in. Um, they were thin-walled, so it's not like they brought a lot to the table. But in addition to being thin-walled, they're really thin-skinned. So I didn't have to skin them to use them in sauce or anything. I would just de-seed them and pop them right in um and maybe one day I can talk about how I do sauce but I do like an immersion blender and like I blend it up anyway so they added a really beautiful color and a really good flavor to sauce and that's really what I like to use them for surprisingly <laughs> So a cherry tomato that I did like was the black cherry. These were, even though I liked them, I don't have a ton to say about them. Really the biggest difference is they were normal cherry tomato sized and they were darker than normal cherry tomatoes. Again, I, they, I wouldn't consider them like a black tomato and I know black like they're not really black I think there's like one or two tomatoes that are actually like black purple um they did not look anything like the picture I will tell you that um again if I have a picture from my garden last year I will put in a picture they were more like pinky they were darker than the black um than the black from Tula. I think the darkest tomato that I did have was the black Versailles, or I've been calling it black Versailles. I don't know how to pronounce it, but black Vernissage. I don't know how to pronounce it, but <clears throat> that one was the darkest. This was darker. It was just a different color. Um, they tasted really good. They were really good dried. They brought a really great variety. Um, again, when I picked them, they were beautiful. Um, they produced pretty well, pretty normal for a cherry tomato, nothing totally blown away. Um, to be honest, I had higher expectations. I've heard really great things, and they were they were good. They were fine. Um, they were they were fine. They'll probably always have a spot in my garden if that makes a difference. I would recommend it. It's just not like it didn't blow my socks off. The next one is actually a twofer. So this is beefsteak and Morgan's Lifter are my three and four. Um, the reason why I'm putting them together is I did not label any of my tomatoes last year. So <laughs> I'm not 100% sure which was which in my garden. Um, I'm not sure at all. I couldn't tell you. I have an idea just solely based on these pictures of which ones were which. Um, for instance, I think there were tomatoes that ended up more round, and I think those were probably the beefsteak, um, and the ones that were just a tiny bit more fluted. I wouldn't even call them fluted. They were just more like flat, I guess. I think were the mortgage lifter. I think, and again, I could be totally wrong, but just from what I think, um, the mortgage lifters ended up being bigger than the beefsteaks. And again, all of my tomatoes, I'll need to do a video about it, but I have several, like, 4 by 4 beds, and I interplant, but I have, depending on what the bed is, I have the majority of it of one vegetable. So, like, my tomato beds are mostly tomatoes with some herbs mixed in or um, I flowers, not last year, but 
Like they're mostly tomatoes, if that makes sense. So it's not like they got any different nutrients or different water. They were in the same bed. Um, and I, I just, <laughs> based on the title, which is, I guess you can never go off of that, but I would have thought the beefsteak would be bigger, but they weren't. Um, but they each had their own really cool positive things, and I will definitely, definitely always grow these. The beefsteaks were more round, and I think, at least on mine, they were more trussed, if that makes sense. And I'm what I mean by that is, on each, I don't even know the technical name other than a truss, but on each branch that produced tomatoes, there would be a cluster of them. So like, you know, at the, um, just at the supermarket, like Food Lion or Walmart, when they have the tomatoes that are still attached to the branch, hopefully you know what I'm talking about, but at my stores, they have those just from conventional farms. And it's just like four or six tomatoes still attached to the branch and they're round. That's what the beefsteak looked like to me in my garden. Um, they were beautiful. They looked like perfect grocery store tomatoes, which I really liked. Um, I, I like different tomatoes for different things. What I like about most heirlooms is that they don't look conventional, but it was really cool to have a more conventional looking tomato um, and it still be an heirloom. So I was that was really cool to me. And the mortgage lifter, they got big and I never get big tomatoes I never get big anything I joke with my husband that we always try to buy varieties that say like giant or extra large because they'll just end up being like medium sized in my garden because I can't grow anything big um but they ended up like almost all of them were like the size of my hand um they did not produce as much as the beefsteak but they were big and they were all good um I loved both of these. They were phenomenal. This one I don't want to like. <laughs> I don't want this to be my number two, but it is. And that is the Big Mama. It is a, oh, I guess my finger's covering it. That's probably oh, metaphorical. Anyway, um, this is a hybrid from a a big box store. Um, if you've watched any of my previous videos or followed me for any length of time, I love the idea of only growing heirloom tomatoes. Like when I started gardening, I was so dedicated to that. I love the idea of heirlooms and their story and preserving history. And in reality, right now for our family and our garden, even though I have that as a goal, ultimately our number one priority is providing healthy homegrown food to my family. Um, so if that means buying hybrids that work really well, that's just what it means. And I love this one. I love, this is, um, I almost made it my number one. It's my number two, but this is a great tomato. It's a paste tomato. But it is huge. And I, again, will insert pictures. They were all, and they're like oblong. They are like two San Marzanos combined. They are like the size of your hand. They're weighty. They are meaty. They are, out of all the tomatoes, they have the thickest walls. Um, they were great for everything. Even though they're technically a paste tomato, like I had searched for really good paste tomatoes, I put them on everything. They are my favorite for putting on burgers. Um, I really like making salsa out of them. They, you have to get them. You just have to. I don't want you to, but you have to. They are great. I will grow them forever. I want to stock up on them in case they stop making them. <laughs> That's how much I love these. They were great. And of course, they were healthy the whole year. This was actually one of the first ones that I started. So if you watched my previous videos about starting seeds in winter, it's, it's complicated what I did last year, but I started um, one tomato plant in, 
gosh, I can't even remember now. You'll have to look back at my video. But I think in either the very beginning of January or the very end of December, and it was um, the, I think it was the Tommy Toe. Yeah, it was the Tommy Toe tomato. And it did grow from, bef I mean, it grew all season, like, phenomenally. I did my tomato plants in batches. Um, again, if you watched another video of mine talking about the, well, no, it's in the same video, I think, talking about why it's hard to start seeds so early, one thing I always run into is running out of space. I don't have a very big seed starting area, and I'm pointing behind you because you are currently on my seed starting <laughs> area. Um, and so when I do them more in batches, I can manage them a lot better. Um, so anyway, this was after that crazy January start. These I started next, and they too grew like with no disease all year long perfectly. So again, Big Mama Hybrid, they're really good. And my number one favorite tomato that I grew last year in 2019 was San Marzano's, which I would have never expected. Um, these just seem like such a basic tomato, but when I tell you the production was something I would have never thought an heirloom could do. It, like the plants were dripping with tomatoes. I think what really made it functional for me, I guess you would say, um, like I'm sure all of you know, San Marzano's are paste tomatoes. So they are really intended to be used in sauce. Um, if you have followed me for any length of time, you know I hate preserving food. <laughs> I hate making sauce. I hate making anything out of my tomatoes or peppers or anything. I like to grow them. I don't like to do anything with them. So the best, to me, the best part about these was that it's like the plant put out rounds of tomatoes. So for my garden last year, there were three rounds where I got like bukus of tomatoes. Um, so really I only had to do like three batches of sauce, <laughs> which was great because part half the battle is just getting enough tomatoes to make enough sauce. Am I right? Am I the only one with that problem? But these, I will definitely insert pictures. Um, I'm sure I have them. But on one, I only had two plants of these. And it was more than enough to make three huge batches of sauce. Um, I also, I added other things, like I mentioned previously, but mainly they were out of these. Um, and they are everything that you would want from a sauce tomato. They were dry, which sounds weird, but I mean, when you, it, it, I, I didn't have to cook these all day. I'm telling you, you know, you hear the grandmas, of, oh, it was on the stove for 12 hours. You'll just have to reduce it and reduce it and reduce it. No, not with these. These made the best, quickest sauce ever. I mean, there was one batch that I actually over did and it was too dry and I had to add chicken broth to it, which never would have happened in my previous gardens or anything. Um, also the seed cavity, it's really, they hardly have any seeds. Um, it's so easy to get the seeds out. Half of these, I didn't even de-seed before I made my stuff with it. I'm telling you, I was so impressed with these. Um, they're just a lot more than I ever expected from an heirloom. But thank you guys for watching. I hope you like and subscribe. And stay tuned for all of my other end of year videos. I'll be doing another one like this about my favorite pepper plants. Um, I'll probably go over my favorite seeds in general for the year, successes and failures, and all that kind of stuff. So I hope you have a Merry Christmas or happy holidays, or just a great break from work if you get that. <laughs> Bye.